Welcome to the Lecterio Podcast. Today we're diving into something really fundamental for nursing practice, the respiratory assessment. Our mission, really, is to get beyond just the textbook stuff. Uh. We want to pull out the essential knowledge, yes, but also those uh, clinical instincts you need, you know, to confidently tell the difference between healthy lungs and lungs that are signaling trouble. Right. And it's more than just putting names to sounds. It's about tuning your ears, really calibrating them. The main idea we want you to grasp is that spotting the abnormal starts with truly deeply knowing what normal sounds like. But maybe even more critically, sometimes the biggest warning sign is hearing a perfectly normal sound, but while hearing it in the wrong place. That's the kind of clinical depth we're aiming for. I like that focus. Okay, let's start with the practical stuff, the how-to, the setup. It's easy to rush this, I think, but getting the technique wrong means the assessment is basically useless, right? Mm -hmm. So first thing, get the client sitting up. Why is that specific position so important? Well, it comes down to gravity and just basic mechanics of breathing. Having the client sit upright, um, maybe leaning forward a bit when you listen to their back, it just maximizes how much their lungs can expand, yeah. especially the bases. And those bases, the bottom parts of the lungs, that's often where subtle things hide first, like early fluid, maybe the start of a collapse. If they're slumped over or lying down, you might miss those initial signs entirely. Okay. That makes perfect sense. Full expansion for the full picture. Uh -huh. And equipment-wise, we're talking stethoscope diaphragm, right? Mm. Oh, <laughs> Why the diaphragm specifically? I know the bell is for lower sounds usually. Yeah, lung sounds, generally speaking, are higher pitched compared to, say, some heart sounds or bowel sounds. The diaphragm is built to pick up those higher frequencies better. It helps filter out some of the lower rumbles so you get a clearer sound of the air moving. Just make sure you press it firmly enough to get a good seal on the skin. Not too hard, obviously. You don't want to cause pain. Got it. And the actual listening technique. Hmm. It needs a system, doesn't it? It's not just random placement. It's about comparing. How do we make sure we cover all the bases, literally and figuratively? It absolutely has to be systematic. And yeah. symmetrical, that's key. You start high up near the collarbones, the apex, and then you work your way down methodically towards the bottom, the base. You need to listen to the front, the anterior chest, and the back, the posterior. But the golden rule is symmetry. Always compare the same spot on the left side to the right side, listen here on the right, then immediately listen to the matching spot on the left. That way, any difference on one side just jumps out at you. And let's really hammer this home for anyone listening. Skin contact. We absolutely cannot listen effectively through clothes. Oh, 100% non-negotiable. Stethoscope bell or diaphragm, it must be directly on the client's bare skin. Fabric. It just creates extra noise, rubs, static. It masks or messes up the real sounds you need to hear. And don't forget to tell the client what you need them to do. Ask them to breathe deeply, but normally, in and out through their mouth. Breathing through the nose can sometimes add extra noise. And crucially, listen for at least one whole breath cycle in and out at each spot before you move. Then, of course, the final step is good documentation. Okay, we've got the how, we know the mechanics. Mm -hmm. Now let's tune those ears. What does normal actually sound like? What are we listening for when everything's working as it should? So normal breathing fundamentally makes these sort of soft rustling sounds as air moves. Mm -hmm. The main sound, the one you hear over most of the lung fields, especially out towards the edges and the bottom, that's called vesicular. It's quite soft, maybe a bit like a gentle blowing sound. You hear it mostly during inspiration, a bit less on expiration. That's air feeling up all those tiny sacs, the alveoli. But it changes if we move the stethoscope more towards the center, right near the big airways, like over the sternum or up near the neck. We start hearing things like bronchial and bronchovesicular sounds. They're definitely louder, higher pitched, more tubular. Why do we need to know those sounds if most of what we hear should be that soft vesicular stuff? Ah, because where you hear them is critical. If you hear those loud, harsh, high-pitched bronchial sounds way down in the bases of the lungs, mm. where you should only be hearing soft vesicular sounds, well, that's a major red flag. It often indicates consolidation. Right. Okay, that's a huge clinical point. Mm. Consolidation, like when the lung tissue isn't full of air anymore, but it's filled with fluid or pus, like yeah. a pneumonia. The soft, airy tissue that normally muffles sound is replaced by something dense. Precisely. That dense, solid-like tissue acts like a better conductor for sound. It transmits those loud sounds from the main airways, the trachea and bronchi, all the way down to the periphery where they normally wouldn't travel. So hearing a normal sound, like bronchial, but in a completely abnormal place, that's often a clear sign of pathology, pneumonia, significant atelectasis, things like that. Okay, so just to quickly recap the other normal sounds and where they belong. Sure. Bronchovesicular is kind of in between bronchial and vesicular. 
softer than bronchial, heard more centrally, like between the shoulder blades on the back. Exactly, or in the center of the chest anteriorly. It's a mix. And then the loudest, harshest sound is tracheal, which, as the name suggests, you hear right over the trachea in the neck. Sounds like air rushing through a big pipe. Makes sense. So if you've listened to everywhere, compared sides, and all you hear are the right sounds in the right places, nothing extra. Yeah. How do you chart that efficiently? The common abbreviation, the one everyone needs to know, is C-TAB, clear to auscultation bilaterally. A more detailed note might say something like, normal vesicular breath sounds heard over the majority of the lung fields bilaterally. No adventitious sounds noted. Or you could specify no wheezes, crackles, raunchy, or stridor. Perfect. So we've established the baseline, the normal, and the significance of misplaced normal sounds. Now for the sounds that are never normal, the adventitious sounds. These are the extras, the signals of problems like obstruction, constriction, fluid. Let's start with maybe the most commonly recognized one, the wheeze. Ah, yes, the wheeze. It's that classic high-pitched whistling or squeaking sound. You usually hear it most prominently on expiration, but sometimes throughout the breath cycle. What's happening is air is trying to flow through airways that are narrowed or constricted. The walls vibrate, causing that sound. Think asthma, COPD exacerbations. You can hear it pretty much anywhere over the lung fields. Okay, high-pitched whistle from narrowed small airways. Now contrast that with raunchy. Raunchy are often described as low-pitched, rattling, or snoring sounds. People sometimes mix them up with wet crackles because they both sound kind of junky or wet. How can we tell them apart? That's a great point. They can sound similar sometimes. Think about where the problem is. Raunchy are low-pitched, rattling, and maybe gurgling sounds. They typically indicate secretions or blockage in the larger airways. Think of thick mucus rattling around in the main bronchi. So you'll hear them best over those larger central airways. Sometimes, if the patient coughs effectively, the raunchy might even clear temporarily, which is a clue. Common bronchitis, for example. Okay, so raunchy larger airways, often mucus, lower pitched rattle, that helps, which means crackles, sometimes still called rails, must be about the smaller airways, right? Right. Crackles are different. They're generally higher pitched, discontinuous sounds, popping, clicking, bubbling. You hear them best during inhalation. It's thought to be caused by air forcing open small airways and alveoli that were collapsed or sticky due to fluid or exudate. They can be described as fine, like rolling hair between your fingers near your ear, or coarse, more like Velcro ripping apart. And thinking location again, crackles, especially if heard at the lung bases bilaterally, often point towards fluid buildup, like in heart failure or pulmonary edema. That's a great comparison. Raunchy is the big pipe gurgling with gunk. Crackles are the little sticky balloons popping open with fluid. Got it. What about inflammation, the pleural friction rub? Yeah, that one's quite distinct when you hear it. It's this creaking, grating, rubbing sound, almost like leather rubbing on leather. A key feature is that you often hear it during both inspiration and expiration because it's caused by the two layers of the pleura, the lining around the lungs, becoming inflamed and rough. Instead of sliding smoothly, they rub against each other with each breath. Okay, that makes sense. Now, the really critical one. Let's say things are getting serious. You might hear multiple sounds, which adventitious sound screams, emergency, Act now. That is unequivocally stridor. Always. Stridor is this high-pitched, often harsh, musical or crowing sound, usually heard loudest on inspiration. And critically, you often hear it loudest over the neck, not necessarily deep in the chest. Wait, you said high-pitched? Wheezes are high-pitched too. Why is stridor so much more urgent? Why isn't just a really loud wheeze coming from higher up? Because of what is obstructed. A typical wheeze means narrowing down in the smaller bronchioles, deep in the lungs, bad, but usually manageable initially. Strider means there's a significant blockage or narrowing in the upper airway, the pharynx, the larynx, the epiglottis, the trachea itself. This is the main pipe. It's the sound of the airway potentially closing off completely. Think anaphylaxis, swallowing the throat, a foreign object lodged there, severe croup or epiglottitis. It's an immediate life threat. Stridor means your patient could lose their airways any second. It requires immediate, urgent intervention. That sound is code red. Wow, okay. That distinction is absolutely vital. Knowing that difference changes everything in terms of response. Being able to triage those sounds by severity is really the mark of an expert assessment. It really is. That's why knowing the baseline, knowing normal vesicular sounds is so fundamental. You need that reference point to instantly recognize not just that something is wrong, but how wrong it is. Is it something needing monitoring or something needing the crash cart? So let's quickly recap our deep dive then. We talked technique, set them up, Diaphragm on bare skin, compare sides, listen systematically. 
Crucial first steps. We establish the baseline. Mostly soft, rustling vesicular sounds are normal. But hearing loud bronchial sounds down low, big warning sign for consolidation. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then we decoded those adventitious sounds. Wheezes for constriction, raunchy for large airway gunk, crackles for small airway fluid popping open, pleural rubs for inflammation, and most critically, identifying stridor, that high-pitched upper airway sound, as the absolute emergency signal. It's clear the theory is important, knowing the what's and the why from charts and lectures. But the real skill, telling a fine crackle from a rub in a noisy room, well, that only comes from doing it, from practice. The next step for everyone listening is straightforward. Pick up your stethoscope, listen to chests whenever you can, train your ear, really learn that normal baseline inside and out. Because that's the foundation for spotting the deviations that can truly make a difference. Keep practicing, keep listening.